Three, two. Welcome back to Earth Station One. Now it is time for the main topic. Take it away, Mikey. What are we yes. talking about tonight? Well, the uh, countdown to Halloween continues, and we are talking all about, uh, uh, well, the ESO movie crew is here, and we're going back, I mean, as far back as we've ever gone. Like, we are going, we are going 100 years back to 1922 to review the silent German classic Nosferatu, uh, Symphony of Horror, I believe it's the uh, subtitle name. Um, yes. And uh, yes, we've got our movie crew here. A Ashley is here. Thank you for having me back. I think this might be the oldest movie I've ever gotten a chance to watch and my first silent film. So I was very excited to dive into this. Yeah, you, you checked off a number of boxes off your because uh, I at the beginning of the year you had a sort of goal as to uh, uh, reach uh, spread out your uh, knowledge of what uh, movies you've watched, right? Like this this counts as a horror film, silent film, a a foreign film. Yes, like, <laughs> I love it. It's like sort of all in a row there. <laughs> yeah, exactly, exactly. Well, it'll be really interesting to hear. Uh, your thoughts on not just the film itself, but your experience watching a silent movie for the first time. And we couldn't count down to Halloween this month without at least once having the award-winning artist Mark Maddox join us. Mark, hey. welcome back. Well, thanks for having me for this episode. You know, it's a, it's a movie that I love dearly. I was shocked the first time I saw it as to how good it was. Usually you think for, uh, silent films and you're like, oh, brother. And... <laughs> And everything. You find out there's actually some really darn great silent films, Metropolis, Cabinet of Dr. Caligari, but this one is really up there, high up on oh, the list very of much great so. silent films. It's very, uh, it moves fast and it's very fun to watch. Um, so, yeah. And still, for most people, or a lot of people, it's still the greatest vampire. I mean, in, on cinema, you know, in terms of yeah. the, in terms of the just absolute creep factor. Yeah, it's it's interesting because, um, you know, I mean, look, uh, we are going to talk about our experience watching this and the influence that the movie had and our own experience with it. But, um, you know, th there's been so much written, talked about with this movie. The influences are countless. So there's no way, you know, we'll be able to really cover the entirety of this movie with this podcast. But I do want to start from the personal experience like we like to do, Mark. And and what was your first time watching this? Do you remember uh, like how oh, yeah. old you were and did you know about it? And, you know, why did you bit. feel compelled to watch a, a silent movie? Because back then, like, I mean, even when I was growing up, it wasn't easy to find these movies no. until like a video store popped up. And even then it was kind of tricky. Well, it was, um, I had seen a few pictures of it in books about vampires and stuff. And even if it was a historical book on vampires, like something by Don Glute or something, you'd see a picture from it. And it said that the vampire that he's writing about is similar to, blah, and then he'd show a picture of Nosferatu. Um, and then I'd seen a few pictures in Famous Monsters of Filmland back in the 60s and early 70s. And then uh, I was living here in Tallahassee and uh, pre-VHS and the local PBS station WFSU ran it on a Saturday night. Uh, so I knew a little bit about it, but um, I, I, I sat through it. My, my uh, twin sisters were there watching it with me in the living room. And my dad only two times in his life ever sat through a film with a large pillow on his lap with him peeking over and looking <laughs> over the pillow and going like oh my god and one of them with the first the first uh, showing of the exorcist on hbo where they had to come out mm -hmm. with a guy who gave a disclaimer that we're not promoting devil tree or anything true story and then and nosferatu because we i mean i ex i didn't know it was going to be as creepy as it was or 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 the the, the vampire was going to be as horrific but that was around i don't know 77 78 was the first time i saw it and I was completely blown away by it. And then um, later, you know, VHS, when it came out, because it was public domain, everybody, every little yep. chumpy little yep. mom and pop <laughs> VHS creation company was was putting out copies. You'd go into Walden's books and there'd be, oh, look, we've got VHS. And there'd be Cabinet of Dr. Caligari and Nosferatu. And at the time, It's a Wonderful Life because nobody owned anything. <laughs> 
<laughs> right. They re-owned it. But yes, um, I was completely blown away by it. Um, I felt that it was, uh, uh, you know, it was um, a, a, a thing of great beauty, even though it's scary. Uh, there was a lot of creativity in it. Absolutely. Absolutely. And to think that the 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 versions that we saw for years or decades were just so compared to the restored one yeah. and the, the the version that is exists now um it's like wow how did we like we were watching it was like sort of watching a movie with a uh, uh it just it just wasn't together yet but yet we didn't know that to us it was just uh, uh that's the way it was yeah. um yeah and that's what it was true of most silent movies at the time um, and we've lost so many silent movies. And as we talked about in the beginning of the show with Dacre, I mean, obviously we almost lost this one. Uh, and uh, imagining uh, if we had, ooh, what a big hole in pop culture that would have been. Uh, Mike, what um, what was your first experience watching this? Well, similar to Mark, you know, I'm a little bit younger, but not that much. And, you know, I saw pictures of it and, you know, probably I was like seven, eight years old when I started hearing about it and seeing the pictures of the vampire and, you know, and seeing, oh, this is, you know, the, this is what was before Dracula. This is, and, but I wasn't able, I had nowhere to see it. They weren't showing it anywhere or they weren't really, you know, people weren't talking about it a ton. And it wasn't actually until I was in college um, and we studied, we we're studying at my film history class and we got to watch um, a somewhat restored version of it. And this, cause this was probably 89 or 90 at the latest. Mm -hmm. And it was, you know, still very grainy compared to the version I watched um, earlier today. The version I watched was barely watchable and everything compared to it. And mm -hmm. it, it's just it was amazing to watch, you know, I'd said, Oh, it's a silent film. It's going to be 15, 20 minutes at the most. And it's no, a one reeler. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, exactly. Cause you know, I, I used to watch, you know, I had watched some silent films before that, you know, I'd had watched like, um, cause this is also the time when I was studying animation. So I was watching like Gertie, the dinosaur, I was watching, oh, right. um, journey to the moon and, you know, items like that. And all the Charlie Chaplin's my, uncle had show my uncles and my grandfather buster keaton's you know that's mostly how i knew silent films so this was something completely different and it was amazing it was it blew me away at when i saw it and it was such a good story it was riveting and it wasn't goofy like i was expecting it to be this was a true you know work of art and it moved really smoothly and I got an A on the paper, so it's good, you know, <laughs> so, and that makes it even better. And over the years, you know, you watch the movies that were based off of this movie and, you know, stuff like that. I'm sure we'll talk all about that in a little bit. So I don't want to get into sure. it now. But, Absolutely. But, I mean, hopefully. Yeah. And so, yeah, it was it was amazing to see it, you know, as a 20 year old. But, you know, now to watch it, you know as a year old so it's pretty cool so <laughs> well we're not as old as orlock so uh you know we got that going for us <laughs> um i don't think nosferatu is the first silent movie that i ever watched uh i think that was either something by chaplin or since i was a big hitchcock fan probably the lodger um uh because that's you know i was really trying to get my hands on everything hitchcock when i was in junior high high school some in that area um so uh but nosferatu i probably watched for the first time around then um and then as i took film studies classes in college i took one class that was just silent movies uh it was from like I think the 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 range of years from that we saw movies from was like eighteen whatever the first one is eighteen like ninety five or something like that yeah, yeah. right yeah. to I think twenty I'm sorry nineteen oh nineteen oh five nineteen oh ten like nineteen ten was somewhere like that was the the range 
Um, and obviously this is 1922. So I, I saw a lot of uh, um, one reelers and shorts, um, but I got, I got into seeing um, silent movies and I wasn't afraid of them. The, th the thing is that, that most people don't know of, there are some that are just really long. Like <laughs> you think of silent movies, Mike, as short, but um, there are like intolerance is like almost three hours, isn't it? Yeah. yeah. Um, uh, I think Birth of a Nation. Seen, yeah, Birth of a Nation is yeah. hugely it, long. Is, is, yeah, yeah, it's like a, a couple hours. I think it's under a couple hours. But um, there's another beautiful, I think it's German, right? Um, silent movie about witchcraft called Hexen, Hexen. which is like yeah is in that four or five i just hours? did i just did a cover for that no it was it was regularly at least the version i saw recently was regular length i did a cover of it for a screen magazine uh pretty powerful stuff uh yeah kind yeah. of surprising yeah the stuff um, that was coming out of europe was really stylized and and well, that was that whole Vi Weimark era pre before certain powers came into play that you know stomped on everything Sure. Uh, the Weimar era was a very, very creative era, and um, and that's why a lot of the creatives that were making stuff, including Fritz Lang with his uh, Metropolis and all that stuff, got out. Uh, mm -hmm. But before that, it was it was beautiful creativity going on there. There's so many films that we I don't even know the names of some of these films, you know, and uh, and they they're you know all that all that creative stuff where you thought on your own was just you know hated yeah and it's amazing how much of that stuff doesn't exist anymore i mean uh over 50 percent of the films that ever got made are destroyed over 50 yeah. percent of the films that were yep. ever made are gone and i've heard it's even um a bigger percentage um I, i'll you know i think uh, the director of this, F. F. W. Murnau, hit, hit, like I think almost every, like maybe just there's one movie that he did before this that he, that exists, but this is his oh, like wow. eighth or ninth movie, and almost all of his stuff before this is gone. Oh, that's uh, so. Um, so yeah, it's a uh, it's a special thing. Um, you know, you don't see them very often. I don't know what you know what what people are watching if they're if they're if they can watch i know most of my friends can't make it through a silent movie without falling asleep like they just they try and they just can't between no dialogue and having to read <laughs> uh Damn you know, these reading. Are, uh, yeah, same people who don't like the subtitles thing right so um and plus it's in black and white although you know, it's not as simple as that, right? Because it does, yeah. they do use colors uh, to depict whether it's night or day or some other stuff happening. Yeah. So it's not just sepia tone. Um, so I'm really interested, Ashley, uh, in what your experience was with this. First of all, like, um, I mean, I know you hadn't watched one before that. Was there a reason that you hadn't watched silent movies? Was there something that was like turning you off of them? And what, what did you feel like what the, the experience would be like? Some honestly, part of it is probably awareness and lack of availability. I think that is one of the benefits of streaming. I was very easily to find a, um, a no charge streaming as well um, on Vudu is where I ended up watching this movie, but mm -hmm. which I think is the great thing about streaming is that now more people across the world can access these works of art. And then again, like a lot of friends and people that I talk about mm -hmm. pop culture with don't really talk about silent movies. I think it's just something I hadn't really encountered before. So I was really grateful for this chance to kind of push me outside of that cinematic comfort zone, really. And I also was surprised when I saw this was like an hour and 20 minutes, but um, kind of putting myself back in the mindset of somebody who would have watched this in like contemporary, I, I think my mind would have been blown. Just the <laughs> fact that, yeah, yes. like- when we've seen stuff like this now, but that's because so many things have drawn from it, like vampire stories, the classic kind of tropes that we think of now, things like this movie were where it originated. And it was just really fascinating to me to realize that I'm sitting down watching a piece of art that was created a hundred years ago. And just in the middle of this very tumultuous time of history, you just had the end of World War I, um, the Spanish flu, the plague or the pandemic that had gone through. So I thought that was interesting. That plague ended up being kind of a part of this movie. I wonder if that was influenced at all 
with people's oh, very I'm immediate sure. experience totally of the sure. Spanish flu. And then yeah. the fact that you have within just a very short period of time, you have World War II and the rise of Nazi Germany. So just like what uh, a period of history for this to take place in. But yeah, I was also really impressed by, in some ways, it's yes, a product of its time and some of the manners of mannerism of the actors maybe some people might now might call it overacting but they need to emote that way because you don't have the dialogue but just how modern it felt in some ways I loved the use of light and shadow there was a particular a moment that stood out to me and it was just a simple moment but you have this guy that's going through and he lights the street lamp and then it illuminates the scene and I just really enjoyed seeing that interplay between light and shadow and how serious this movie is. I think, yeah, a lot of times when I thought of silent movie, I would think about like kind of slapstick physical comedy, but this is Stone real- cops, right? Yeah, exactly. And there's, and there's nothing wrong with that either, but yeah, there's some very chilling moments in this movie. And yeah, I just felt really thankful that I got a chance to see it. Obviously the version, there's still some graininess to the film, but just the fact that they were able to preserve it to this extent a film that was made 100 years ago was just really cool. So yeah, I think watching a film like this is a must for any film fan. Like even if you, this type of movie isn't your thing, I feel like it's very worthwhile as a film fan to watch and just kind of give you a greater appreciation of how the art was developed and how much movies that we rely on today. Like a movie that I watched this summer called uh, nope by Jordan Peele. Like we wouldn't have movies like this today if not for these early groundbreaking stories. So yeah, I, I thought it was really valuable experience for me to watch as a film fan. Now that said, um, you know, because it's, it's listed as a classic. So obviously, you know, um, it, it's got that sort of reputation. It's an important movie. It's a influential movie. It, it's, uh, you know, so when you go to watch it, you're like, okay, I'm going to watch something that's a pretty big deal, right? But at the end of the day, you're just watching a movie, mm-hmm. right? So if you set aside all of the importance of the movie, does did it work for you on a personal level? I think it does. Yeah, it's a simple story, but it's told well. And I think it speaks to I think why horror movies continue to have that enduring popularity because obviously there aren't really vampires out there but like the fear of danger unknown things like that are something that we as humans can relate to and this film was a particular interest to me because for a long time I avoided horror movies because I thought oh that's too gory or that's too scary and then um I credit Jordan Peele's Get Out for changing my mind. I was like, this is a phenomenal movie. There's some great storytelling. What have I been missing this time? So yeah, I think this is a great example of a simple story, but it's compelling. And I also love that um, because it's a silent movie, there's not even any necessarily translation. It's a story that speaks to you regardless of what language. And I think honestly, you could watch this movie, the title cards help, but even if you somehow didn't have those, I feel like you could follow along and tell what was happening with the story due to the characters and the light and the cinematography that they were using. Yeah. Yeah. Had you ever seen a version of Dracula before? I don't think I have, which is funny oh, wow. because it's such a pop culture staple. So it's one of those <laughs> things really like, is. Oh yeah. Yeah. I'm sure I've seen the rest. Well, gosh, have I actually sat down and seen a movie with this character. So it was interesting doing a little bit of research too about how um, this movie kind of tells its original story, but was inspired by that. And just the idea of literature just throughout history being inspired by and people doing their own interpretations and retellings. The uh, yeah, because it is, I mean, it is basically uh, Murnau telling the story of Dracula. Now there are some changes, obviously uh, both for, legal reasons that didn't really work out for them and uh and and artistic reasons uh the ending for example um is 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 quite original and i think uh it's telling as well and uh you know the thing about vampire movies uh they're just a vampire movie nine times out of ten especially the classics 
the, the vampire is never just a vampire. There's always a lot of symbolism, mm-hmm. metaphorical images, things going on uh, that's especially of its time. But I think now watching, I don't know how Mike and Mark, how, I don't know how you felt about this, but watching it now, watching it this weekend, it's the first time I've seen it since the pandemic. <laughs> so now I have the <laughs> pandemic experience as well, yeah. like they did back then in, in 22 when the when the audience was watching it. Um, it does feel like there's it's more impactful, especially uh what's going on in the town and the fear of the plague and the and the black death, right? Um what about you, Mark? What what since you've seen it probably more than any I've of seen us. it more uh, than all of you and all your friends exactly, combined. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> I've literally um, watched it some more than twice, sometimes in one day, just for my own entertainment. So yeah, nice. go ahead. Um, he has what, the count uh, like, tattooed on the, his back, actually. <laughs> off the off the most recent viewing, what what new information did it bring to you? Well, the interesting thing is. It, you know, you guys were talking about, well, we had an old crappy copy and all that. And then and then it's like and the new restored copy. Oh, wow. Well, there is some real greatness in that restoration. But there's also some telling stuff, too. Like, I've got this huge TV set that's actually the brand name, Big Ass TV, in the living room. And the, <laughs> and the count walks in. Remember when he's skulking through the town supposedly at night but they had to do it in the daytime yeah, yeah. for lighting and he's tiptoeing through like and he stops and they show him observing big old close-up and you can see that the ear and you can see a big old piece of tape holding his pointed ear on <laughs> and you can see the big strap of tape going around his skull to hold his his bald head on you know that kind of thing so it's kind of like oh that took me out of the <laughs> that took me out of the movie <laughs> having said that uh, there are so many things in this film with the clarity now that just make it even that more entertaining, that more in your face, that more in the room with you. And I would still say out of all these vampire movies, I've watched some anywhere from superb to absolutely horrid and whether there's anything, this film, I would still challenge some people to, to watch it at two o'clock in the morning or one o'clock in the morning in a, in a house with all the lights off by yourself. And if you've never seen it, there's no gore. Uh, there's the the fang work. Isn't much in this, you know, and all that kind of stuff, but just the sheer creep factor and Max Shrek and his performance and the use of unusual special effects at the time, the the like almost like a plank of wood to raise him straight up <laughs> yeah. out of the coffin, which which you know was later. You know, there's been other people that have have done that. Uh, you know, and and uh, Coppola did an homage to it in in Bram Stoker's Dracula. But when you when you watch it, like I said, my dad looked at it from behind the pillow. My dad had been to Vietnam and stuff, and yet here he is still, you know, looking out from behind a pillow because it creeped him out. But what face out of any face in the universe would be the worst for you to wake up in the middle of the night and look out the window and see that looking in at you? I mean, it's still the ugliest and most horrific and most evil and vile face that's ever been created. And that's why so many films like uh, what's the Stephen King Salem's Lot, the TV movie and stuff like that. And uh, what we do in the shadows, everything use that same bald rat like vampire. So the new um, monsters even did. Even the new That's monsters true. did. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. And uh, it's because it's like still the ultimate creep, creep vampire. It's the pestilence vampire. So, yeah, yes. I mean, um, when you and what you were asking, what you were talking about earlier with the uh, uh, the plague and all that, um, you know, it was such a big deal back then. I mean, and people were, you know, uh, people were had polio and people were, uh, were, were, were vulnerable to all this kind of stuff. Even redone later in 1979 in, in Werner Herzog's remake, which is also a great movie in its own right, but it's so, forefront. so many rats, so it's, many rats. It's it, yeah. Why did it have to be rats? But it's, oh it's man, like the so streets many... run like are full of rat rats in that one. It's and just people like, oh my God. amongst the corpses and stuff. Finally just, oh, to heck with it. Let's, you know, let's get drunk. Uh, um, and that's why I try to tell people about stuff. You need to pay attention to history, you know? So. Mm-hmm. 
Mike, what about you? What uh, what's something from this uh, latest, most recent viewing that uh, really um, spoke to you on this on this time? The pacing, the pacing was wonderful on this. It didn't feel like there was really a dead moment, no pun intended, and it felt like it just moved all the way through. I was never bored. I was like riveted to the screen. Yeah, I was, you know, talking back to it a little bit when, you know, I was reading and stuff like that. But, you know, so, but it was just the way it was shot, the way, you know, you know, oh, it's supposed to be night. I was like wondering why the vampire was out because, you know, they were filming a lot during the day and everything. And even Judy, you know, who had seen this years and years ago when she was in college, uh, was watching it with me. And she says, this is great. This is, you know. And it's fun because you see how different, so many different scenes that with the vampire, especially that are still used in film today. And it's awesome. It's thinking this is a hundred years ago and this was setting the table to stuff we see in modern cinema and everything. And that's what makes it pretty amazing with this. I think uh, this time when I was watching it, it really made you know it, it made an impact on me this time because I was looking at it not as a horror movie because I was thinking, you know, when Murnau made this, it's not like he was like I'm going to make a horror movie. <laughs> I mean, for him, he was just making because there wasn't really a genre then, right? Like there wasn't like a specific. He's not like I'm going to make a you know a horror movie. Because he was hanging out with, uh, you know, painters and uh, writers and authors and poets. And uh, I think he was attracted to dark material. I think later after this, he makes a version of Faust, if I'm not mistaken. Great movie. Um, Just watched it last year. Fantastic. Yeah. And so so he's attracted to dark material. But for him, it's it's telling the story, but it's every shot. Uh, every scene, every sequence, uh, you know, the soundtrack. That's why uh, I re I strongly recommend uh, the Kino Lover version because it has the original soundtrack. Uh, well, not the original soundtrack, but it uses the original score that he wanted for the movie because, you know, with uh, all the public domain copies, you don't have any idea what kind of music they're going to use. They're probably going to slap on some sort of, you know, classical music that they have uh, rights to, or that is free use as well, or some sort of some dude with a synthesizer, you know, like, like, like I've seen, I've seen some pretty bad ones, but, um, uh, but, you know, he's, he's making uh, like a statement. He wants to make a, a it's an art film. For him you know this is an artistic film again vampire doesn't mean vampire it means that everything means so much more um and it made it made the movie have even though i think it flows as mike said it flows really easily but it still feels like it has like real weight and real stakes to it uh and there's a i'm intending that pun um even though there's not a stake that's used in this you know this year it is a, a vampire movie with no stakes um yeah uh because i do think the ending in particular is you know it, it why does why did Murnau change that um you know he gives he gives the 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 woman character in this uh so much agency uh, you know, for actually sac making the ultimate sacrifice to stop this monster, and uh, spoilers, and <laughs> uh, damn it, you had to ruin it. For <laughs> you know, right? um, and I just thought that was that was really kind of progressive. You wouldn't think that a movie made in 1922 would do that sort of thing. Yeah, well, a lot of things back then were pre-code. You know, films were kind of loose back then until yeah. about 1933 you know in the united states that is where it was like no 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 you can't do that yeah. anymore and then you go and you watch movies pre-1933 and you kind of go wow they did some pretty wild stuff yeah you but know? the u.s like the american filmmakers weren't doing stuff like this well like, I mean, that, the tar that's what's tarzan, really tarzan had actual full frontal nudity and i was shocked yes, i know yes but uh but, uh, commissioner yeah, when, gordon <laughs> <laughs> but uh but you look at uh you look at uh but uh, yeah i mean now another version and i'm trying to find this is the is james bernard 
who was Hammer's main soundtrack guy, the one who did all that crazy, really intense Christopher Lee, Peter Cushing music, did a soundtrack that they play on BBC where you've got Hammer style music combined with Nosferatu. It killed it. Oh, wow. Killed it here. Yeah, that that would be, yeah. I do wish, yeah, that would be kind of cool if there was an edition that had, you could choose what sort of soundtrack you wanted, the original really? soundtrack. Or I've had some other people that have suggested other scores uh, when I posted that I'd rewatched this and people were like, oh, you should check out this score and the score. So uh, I, there has been some, um, you know, interesting music applied to this. Um, and obviously the imagery is, is key. I mean, that's something that I think is going to stay with you. I think, uh, you know, that's the, that's one of the differences between silent movies and movies now is that they're so focused on the visual image to be able to tell the story without dialogue, to be able to tell the story, even without music, if necessary, um, that's why a lot of the great filmmakers came from like Hitchcock came from doing silence because they're even when they were, even when they could talk, they were still telling the movies visually first yeah. uh, and setting them up visually. And I find it's not like, you know, I'm not ragging on today's movies or whatever, but it's like, man, I wish, you know, they, they were more visually stylized uh, to tell a story, um, you know um, what's something else that, that Nosferatu, this movie, uh, brings to the table, or what's something else that you noticed from this, Ashley? Yeah, I'm glad you had uh, referred to the female characters because that's something that impressed me as well. That's something as a female fan of pop culture, whenever I'm watching a classic movie, I kind of know going in, <laughs> You're sometimes cringe. yeah the female characters are going to make me like face palm a little bit but it's like of the era but i was kind of impressed again by how this goes the female character does die at the end but again she's the one who kind of figures it out and it's like i'm going to do this i'm going to be the hero and sacrifice myself for the town and she's the one who does the research and figures it out while everybody was panicking. So she was really an intriguing character, which is more than I expected. Like in the beginning, I thought, oh, this is this guy's wife. She's just kind of distraught that he's leaving. But again, there's more going on. Like she's sensing the supernatural threat of the vampire. Like um, she kind of knows that there's some bad things coming. And so, yeah, like you said, she does have a lot of agency, which I thought was cool. And also interesting that um, the main character, the one guy who goes to see uh, the vampire, he's warned off by the villagers, but doesn't listen and goes anyway. So that's a classic theme in literature and in real life. Sometimes you try to warn people that something bad's going to happen. They're like, ah, whatever. And they continue on and um, something bad happens to them surprisingly. So yeah, I, I thought it was shockers. It is really. It was cool to see. And also, this is kind of a side note, but I'm a big fan of period dramas like Downton Abbey and things like that. And it was cool to think, oh, 1922, this is a movie that those characters could have gone to watch something contemporary wow, yeah, yeah. at yeah. that time. So that was kind of just, it's not necessarily related, but I thought just kind of a fun aside. I'm such a fan of period dramas that this would have been an influential work of art at that time. That was my favorite and Downton Abbey episode where they went to see Nosferatu and I, it was a missed, and threw up. You know, it was a missed opportunity for a crossover, I, I would say. <laughs> you really Nosferatu versus Downton Abbey. Yes. <laughs> I, the I new think neighbor. it's interesting. Oh, he really yeah. <laughs> that's hey, that's think, right. Yeah, really. <laughs> I think it's uh I think it's interesting too. The other thing I really was aware of this time when I was watching it is that it's made in 1922. But the movie, the story takes place in 1838, almost, you know, a couple decades, less than 100 years before yeah. this is being made. So we're really like watching a movie that's going back in time, telling a story that's even further back in time. Yeah, it's yeah. like a um, very early period drama, even though now this um, time in which it was made is considered like would be a period drama that we would watch about characters. So really interesting yeah. to see that. And you kind of like have the to forget forget that like you know when you're watching it 1922 oh yeah people don't people aren't dressed like this in 1922 like this is not how people yeah. dress right in 1922. Yeah. No, no 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 they're I not mean, even dressed some, like in that some, in dracula it, which was like 1890 something in, 
in some villages maybe but like yeah. for most most part they didn't come you know but they didn't modernize but uh we've talked about the look of orlock and i think it's important too that this is a version of dracula one of the first versions of dracula that's on film that i mean you could argue but really it's not the vampire here and orlock in particular is not, not sexualized like oh, this i mean most uh, uh-uh. most almost every version of dracula after this certainly with bella on yeah the vampire is sexualized sort of crazy. but here i i don't i you know i mean i guess you could find him sexually attractive but i mean that's that's a yeah that's yeah exactly nobody's raising their hands <laughs> no no <laughs> <laughs> i think that's a i don't think that's what they were going for right um something else about this movie mark that uh that sticks with you well I gotta admit, Mike, when you were talking about, and there's this version, and there's that version, and there's one guy with a synthesizer, there's another one with the score with a guy on a banjo. I mean, all this kind of stuff. I forgot that I was actually participated in one of those, which was um, uh, Cortland Hull, who is related to Henry Hull, the werewolf of London put mm-hmm. out a version about two years ago with uh, a new soundtrack and an introduction by Mark Hamill. And they had me do some artwork for it. So when you were talking about that, I, oh yeah. I mean, the the box is over there someplace on, on the shelf, but I, uh, but um, the, uh, what was your question again? <laughs> <laughs> well, you brought something really? new to it. So uh, yeah, what, uh, yeah, what's something else about the movie that? Uh... Well, let's talk about you know uh, things in there, um, certain settings and ways that they decided to do stuff that was brilliant with no money. I think that's one of the reasons when you were talking about the ending of this film, the woman uh, basically threw herself on a live grenade for the town, and uh, but the visual ending where he's walking across and turns into a puff of smoke. That's a budget thing. I mean, Mm -hmm. it's a star Trek transporter thing. We can't take a spaceship down to the planet every week. So let's beam them down. This was, we can't have the big fight. We can't have the castle, you know, all that kind of stuff with other scenes in the film where it was a style over budget, just things like the length of his fingers that were super long when he would become full on vampire mm. or he looked even I don't want to say normal but when he's when he's talking to the guy at first it's like boy that guy's ugly but then he gets like <laughs> extra ugly there's like a, <laughs> put some extra stink in it um another thing too like old radio where you would listen to something and your brain built everything in in your head like if you were listening to a shadow episode, you would build a whole city and whatever they were doing. And this is the opposite. I will sit there and watch this film and I will be the voices of the people in my head. And like Nosferatu will go, Oh, your wife has a lovely throat. You know, I would, we supply the noise. Like he, he mm-hmm. looks so horrific. What does he sound like? And your brain provides his voice. Um, the uh the the settings the european settings the germ german settings the um uh willingness like when he the guy looks out the door at night i think this is one of the greatest scenes in film history period let alone a horror film where he looks out of the door of his bedroom and the count is way down the end of the hallway full on bald full on pointed ears and the guy just starts freaking out and slams the door and runs and hides under his pillow and then when the door opens and the count comes through with his it's almost like his long fingernails and his hands are glued to his thighs and he mm-hmm. just fits in the door and he and he and he walks through i remember the first time i saw it i thought this is pure genius they're doing everything that they can to think about, you know, once again, you're in your bed and you see this thing coming through the door mm-hmm. or the guy who goes on the ship, he goes, you know what? I've had enough. I'm going to go downstairs and I'm going to kick some backside. And he goes downstairs with the hatchet, starts <laughs> chopping at some stuff. Wow. There's a lot of rats here. And then the coffin 
flips open and eh, the vampire stands straight up and the guy just loses it, you know, wah, and then just runs and just jumps <laughs> off. The, I mean, every time I've ever watched that film, it's like, yep, that's what I do. I, I take my chances in the ocean, yeah. you know, like all of the sailors and jaws. I take my chances in the ocean rather than, than, than when I saw that it's like, okay, game over, man. There's a lot of beautiful, brilliant little horror things that are truly horrific in this. And I applaud them on the micro budget that they had, that they pulled so many things off so well, or, or him in the window, looking across the street at the woman with his hands like when, this. When, when and she staring looks through. across the window and just sees, you know, it's beautifully shot because you can kind of see that he's in the building. He's in, he's in one of the windows or whatever. And, and yeah. he's, he's in shadow, but it's just enough that it's really creepy. And then when he's down at the doorway, it's just like, it's, yeah, it's, and especially since, you know, if it was a guy watching him, it would be different, but since it's a woman watching him, it's even more like creepy, you know? Yeah. Yeah. Yeah um the creepiest part of the movie is when the guy steps on the rat and the rat bites him in the toe and he jumps up and down. that really bothered me <laughs> <laughs> but yeah great stuff incredible visuals absolutely uh visuals that stick with you yes. and i think that's the that's the key to a lot of these really great silent movies they're telling the story visually so i think you since there's nothing else really to grab onto there's no witty lines of dialogue or whatever there's just the visuals so your 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 brain is it, i think it's more impactful um as been when you get a really strong visual it's some like something that you probably will never forget yeah. Uh, yeah. unless you're like me getting older and just forgetting like what i had for <laughs> breakfast today um uh mike what's something else about the movie uh that uh you want to point out um, just how visually stunning this was and how, you know, moody it was. It was just an amazing film that, you know, it makes you go, wow, this guy knew what he was doing. The director, I mean, he, he was very masterful at the filming and the scenery and, you know, it was the scenes where, you know, the, like the woman, the mean woman and the character, she knew right away there was something not right going on. And, mm -hmm. you know, and she was trying to warn everybody and everyone was like, oh, silly woman, don't worry about it and everything. And it's such a trope, but for that to be one of the first ones to do something like that was just amazing and everything. And that's what one of the many things I love about this was you know you see this and we're so jaded nowadays with a lot of these type of characters the shot then the scenery and the shots and this is all new back then mm -hmm. and everything mm -hmm. and the this is just what made it such an amazing film yeah um and you mentioned the the, the sort of the mood because yeah i've seen you know i mean they paint sometimes silent movies just like any other genre are painted with such a wide you know yeah. brush that you, it's like but i've seen enough silent movies to know that when this when this starts you know it's not a chaplain movie <laughs> you know it's not oh, a comedy no. mm -hmm. i mean just from the like the, the shot of the town like you just you did like this atmosphere is there from uh from the first frame um and you know we mentioned that murnau later on or after this makes faust and that he was interested in dark dark material but it also should be pointed out that when he uh left germany and went to uh hollywood uh 1927 he made a movie called sunrise which some people consider one of the most one of the greatest american movies ever made um and it's a very like uh, it's a movie about relationships. It's a mission. It's a, about love, and it's a visually striking movie. But it's not horror at all. It doesn't. It, it like it's. You would not know that the same person made both of these movies. I don't think. Um, uh, so um, yeah, if you're looking for something, you know, completely on the opposite of this by Murnau, uh, Sunrise, 1927 is one that uh, you should definitely check out. Um, other things that are Nosferatu related, um, I think uh, I ha we have to we have to say, um, uh, oh, what's it called? Come on, Shadows of the Vampire. 
Shadow yes. of the Vampire with Willem Dafoe. Shadow of the Vampire. Yes, yeah. with oh, William Dafoe. That was such a creepy movie, too. Yeah. It's about the making of Nosferatu. Mm. Kind of, um, sort of. <laughs> yeah. But it's a fantasy which, because... Yeah, yeah. It's, yeah, it's not... It's not... Yeah, it doesn't... Yeah, but... Um, so, but it is a, uh, it is a, I think it's a fun, I think it's like, sort of, I, I look at it as sort of a dark comedy, but um, yeah. uh, especially from Defoe's performance, because he plays Max Shrek, who, uh, man, Max Shrek, I mean, talk about typecast. <laughs> I mean, I just know, like, <laughs> like, or he's only known for playing a Nosferatu, really. He's not, or Orlock, he's not really known even though he did several other movies yeah. um, much of many of them don't exist. So, but, um, and, and yes, I think if you watch shadow of the vampire, you think that he's a nut uh, because <laughs> William Defoe, the way William Defoe plays him, let's just say he really gets into character. Right. Mm. Yeah. Ashley, the, the point of the film is, is that, um, Oh, who's the, who's the, who plays Murnau in it? It's um... uh, Malkovich. Uh, John Malkovich uh, 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 actually gets a real vampire to make a vampire movie with, and Defoe is really a vampire. But I love Defoe's performance. It's almost like alcoholism. You know, little bats flying along, and he grabs it, <laughs> bites it, and goes, sucks the blood out of it, throws it on the ground, and goes, I hate my life. <laughs> gosh um yeah it's it's pretty it's uh it's a pretty wild uh it's a great concept movie you know things coming out of left field but um yeah um uh, warner herzog uh herzog. made a remake and uh you know you'd think that you know why should you make a remake of this it's one of the greatest movies ever made uh, but he, uh, but to Ashley's point, as we talked about, this movie was not readily available for people to see. Um, and so, uh, I think that, I think, uh, Herzog felt he was up to the challenge, um, hires, uh, Klaus Kinski, right? Um, yes. Klaus Kinski to play Nosferatu, uh, very problematic actor, like as we, uh, like problematic person, <laughs> uh, but, uh, fits the bill let's put it this way for nosferatu they made a uh, kinski made a sequel later on uh with another director which is garbage uh, actually yeah I mean, somebody, um but <laughs> no it's not but it's the not. but the remake uh what did you say mark 1977 1979 took 1979 Linda to see it. yeah it's yeah. um it's it's a, it blows my mind that this came out around the same time as the frank langella dracula because they're yeah. so completely different I, I think I think the theater we saw it at, uh, Linda and I went to see it. At, it was like, okay, we're going to see this, and like the next week we were back there to see Apocalypse Now, which was the brand new film. This is not, does not have the fright factor that the original Nosferatu has. He, uh, he, the Kinski version of the vampire is more sickly. He's more weary. Uh, you can definitely see some stuff, but this does not play on a horror level. It was rated PG. Hmm. And, uh, you know, it's like a lot of Herzog's films. They're very contemplative and, you know, there's scenes with stuff going on for a very long period of time. But a lot of people love this film, too. But it's very it's it, in terms of intensity, it's not nearly as intense as the original, but I love it. I think it's great. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. And the same cities and the same places, the photographed mm -hmm. in the same spots, you know, which is really kind of a nervy thing to do. You know, it's not as bad as that remake of Psycho, <laughs> where they did it frame by frame or anything. No, 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 no. But uh, it's a great, it's a great and, film. I recommend it. And and he, let's just say, like his budget, his rat budget was like significantly more because yeah. that there are, I mean, there's a sequence where rats are coming off the ship, and it's like it, it's like it's like they're coming out of the TARDIS. There's just so oh. many rats. Like you're like, how many? Like how many yeah. fit on there? Whatever. Mm -hmm. And apparently they were, you know, there's probably still rats like somewhere in the city <laughs> like because because they went everywhere and they they were not tracked. But um, uh, but it's a it's a solid watch as well. Oh, yeah. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the original is is still stands out as at the end of the day, it's just a it's a remake and the original still stands on its own. Uh, Mike, is there any other uh Nosferatu related material that you can think of that uh you wanted to bring to light no it's 
you know, he popped up everywhere, especially once he became open property. You yeah. saw parodies of him. You saw characters that look like him, even Buffy the Vampire Slayer or, you know, other, you know, what they do in the shadows has characters like it. You know, anytime you saw the older vampire, guess who he looked like a lot <laughs> of times. And it was, it's just interesting. But the, you know, the William Defoe version of the movie, um, for me, it was such a weird, like, oh my God, a real, he with Max Shrek was a real vampire. Oh my God. You know, that type of thing. And it was so much fun. But, you know, to, to me, it's like, you know, a lot of people, when they say vampires, they think of Dracula and they think of Bela Lugosi and everything. And it's interesting because for me, when I think of vampires, I think of this. This is what I think of more and everything. And he does not sparkle, folks. I trust you on that one. Uh -huh. He does not. <laughs> yeah. I, uh, that's an interesting thing, too, too, because I guess it is generational. Because, look, I don't know. Uh, and, you know, I, I don't know what generations, uh, the recent generations think of when they think of when they hear the word Dracula, do they think of Gary Oldman? Do they think of, you know, who, like, you know, I don't know. Um, I mean, Bell is still out there as being probably like the face of Dracula. He's the iconic, uh, he's the icon. Yeah. Of I think, I think probably most people probably go like, think, even if they haven't seen it, yeah, and Nosferatu is one of those things too. Even people, not a lot of people have seen it, but yet they recognize the image. Yeah, um, and uh, and so uh, it's very, um, yeah, its influence will still continue on. It's a hundred years old, and it's you know, it's still, it's still. I found it still relevant, <laughs> you know, <laughs> watching it. I and I'm not going to say it felt like a modern movie because that's not true, but I could understand it and relate to it. In a, in a in a level especially pre, post pandemic mm -hmm. that i never could before yeah, um, i'd still put it in as one of the if not the top three the top five vampire films of all time oh i guess yeah, yes, i'm silent. I completely with that yes, that's so true yeah um you know it is uh, yeah it's hard to argue that yeah. um ashley okay so yeah let's uh sort of wrap up ashley what do you have any final thoughts on on watching nosferatu or your experience with that no just again i thought it was a really worthwhile experience uh for me as a film fan to watch a classic movie in a silent movie and just encourage people like don't be afraid to try something a little bit different i was worried like oh man this is an hour and a half no dialogue how will it hold people's interests? And yet it does. So yeah, don't be afraid to try something just a little bit different and you might find something cool and gives you appreciation of stories and that you enjoy today that couldn't have been made without some of those historical works. I agree. And I, I do sort of apologize because I know horror is not your thing. So doing these uh, movie reviews, uh, especially as far as your first silent movie, we sh probably should have broken to lightly, like maybe with a Chaplin movie or a uh, or a uh, Harold Lloyd movie, Buster Keaton, maybe uh, those are uh, those are lighter, but um, those are those are worthwhile as well. And I oh, definitely encourage TCM has a great uh, show on Sundays called Silent uh, Silent Sunday Movie Nights. Sunday, yeah. and mm -hmm. uh, hosted by Jacqueline Stewart, who's amazing, um, and uh, brings a lot a lot of uh, uh, silent movies that I'm that I that are new to me, and uh, it's still I think a viable uh, art form in itself. I think. Oh yeah. Um, so, uh, and I would love to see. I don't know if it would be possible to get funding for something like a big budget project, but to see like Jordan Peele do a silent horror film, I think that would be really fascinating to see some of the way he uses visuals and characters and storytelling. I would like to see some of my favorite directors take on a little bit of a challenge and what would a modern day silent movie be like? What, what would that look like? I think that would be kind of cool to see. Interesting. Yeah, it would, it would be, be like interesting. a quiet place. Uh, 
Yeah, yes. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe. But even more so, completely quiet place. A very completely quiet place. Yes. <laughs> uh, well, I don't know about a, a I know it's not going to be silent, but there is a new version of Nosferatu in the, in the making uh, made by um, it's going to be directed by Robert Eggers. So it should oh, be interesting. interesting. Yeah, with yeah, Bill Skarsgård as Orlock. Hmm. Uh, like he, so, does, he does creepy well. Yeah, he's pretty good. He's pretty good. Yeah, yeah. so it'll be really interesting to see that. Uh, and Anna Taylor Joy, I think, is in it as well. Um, so yeah, I'll be I'll be game for that. That should be interesting. Um, but uh, final thoughts on Nosferatu, at least as far as the podcast goes. Uh, I know we'll continue to watch this and and uh, and learn from it, but. Mark, um, the overall um, thing about silent films, uh, I've seen silent films that have blown me away. Abel Gantz's Napoleon uh, and uh, stuff like that. But when it comes to films, you were saying something at the very beginning of the show about silent films and people not paying attention. And I would recommend heavily that any person who would think that we're talking about Nosferatu rent, buy, purchase, whatever it takes. Uh, Charlie Chaplin's Modern Times. It's extremely funny. We got dumped off at the movie theater as little kids, packed, 500 kids packed into a movie theater, and the parents, as they're leaving, go, it's a silent movie. And we're like, what, what, what does that even mean? And we watched it and walked out of there. And I said, that's one of the funniest films I've ever seen. And I still put it in as like the top five or 10 hilarious about a guy dealing with modern technology and all this kind of stuff. It's beautiful. It's warm. It's thoughtful. Another one, Fritz Lang's Metropolis. Sure. Uh, and if you feel like you've got a, oh my gosh, I can't take this, then put on the Giorgio Moroder rock and roll version from the 80s which a lot of people still like and i still do i know but uh -huh. but watch metropolis uh there's uh watch cabinet of dr caligari watch another hundred year old film watch um uh the barrymore uh john barrymore version of dr jekyll and mr hyde his thing is really creepy when he turns into mr hyde it is horrific his face his whole face is stretched eventually they end up putting a dome on top of his head but a lot of it was like the original theatrical play where during around the time of jack the ripper they thought the guy might be jack the ripper because he could distort his face so much on the stage Barrymore borrowed from that in this film. Um, silent films are wonderful. Um, yeah, there are some stinkers, but you know, the comedies, <laughs> Buster Keaton, Chaplin, all that stuff's wonderful, but don't give up on them. Uh, Nosferatu itself, super classic, uh, very easy to watch. I've shown it to, you know, shown it to my kids. I've shown it to other young people and they go, wow, it's pretty cool. And that's why so many like rock and roll bands, you know, pick out elements out from some of these silent films. I remember mm -hmm. watching a Madonna uh, live concert where the whole thing was Metropolis based. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Watch stuff where Nosferatu is picked up again and again. The rock and roll guys love it. You know, as much as they love their misfits tattoos. You There's know, footage of it in uh, Under Pressure, the Queen video. Yes, absolutely. So um, don't give up on silent films, people. There's <laughs> there's more there than you realize. And cabinet of dr caligari watch it that is a whack film with distorted sets and everything else and it's only 45 <laughs> minutes so if you think you're gonna get bored <laughs> it's a little longer than gilligan's island so you know have at it uh mike what about you um uh, pretty much hey. this is the standard for silent films for me between this metropolis and you know most of the charlie chaplin films this is you know these are standards. Um, there's so much great stuff out there for silent movies. Um, even go earlier into the early 1900s, like Journey to the Moon or, you know, items like that. And it is, there's just so much wonderful stuff. And folks, there's even, you know, silent cartoons and, you know, animation that, you know, definitely check out. A lot of people think, animation started with disney now folks there was stuff way before walt disney and we've talked about it on the podcast here when we did the history of animation and you know we talked about gertie the dinosaur or we talked about felix the cat we've talked about 
you know, even some of the other stuff, you know, like so much good stuff out there that, you know, is silent and in black and white, sorry to, you know, hurt you there folks, but black and white stuff is amazing. And you know what, it's worth checking out and, you know, please do. There's a whole history of film and such that's out there that you should check out mm -hmm. and spend a lot of time you're going to fall in love all over again with cinema if you do that trust me on that yeah there's uh, uh you know among cinephiles there's a term called pure cinema uh which you know you hope to experience uh most cinephiles have experienced on occasion and that's with the really really great great films and nosferatu is pure cinema you have a it's a pure cinema movie it's the type of story the type of thing that you can only experience cinematically mm -hmm. that doesn't mean you can't watch it on home but i mean it's just like the visuals uh the way that the storytelling is and this is uh and f now fw murnau was one of the first like creators of as ashley pointed out and many of us have pointed out um of the the same tools that are being used today mm -hmm. these guys help develop and uh you know so but but aside from the importance of the movie aside from the fact that it's a work of art it still gets you at a at a at a, at a guttural level like it still impacts you and it still is is a very personal experience so i strongly suggest everybody out there i mean Spoilers or not, um, to to check out Nosferatu, um, because I don't, you know, it, it's an experience. It's an experience that um, there's not many like it now, um, and uh, in a lot of cases, like the the people that were blown away by it in 1922, you can still be blown away by it mm -hmm. in 2022. Mm -hmm. So, oh darn straight. Uh, so uh, I have never seen it on the big screen. That's my only like eh, sad moment. One day I hope to see a really beautiful copy on the big screen. But but uh, anyway, uh, thank you guys so much for joining us for this discussion. Uh, we'll be right back. And then we're going to close out the show.